Thank you now. And I come and don't hear me. Eat you up. Right, he ran out the door. And every tree turned. That's right. The end. That's so good. Well, night, night, okay? May we have to again? Okay, start over. Okay. He was really sweet and kind. He just had the sweetest smile that would just um, light up the room. When I was like a baby, I think he really, really, really loved me until I started getting old enough to like bite him and smack him. He liked to <laughs> pester me all the time by thumping me or calling me names. He used to call me liver and onions <laughs> to get on my nerves that he would have those big brother moments when he would always be there for me and protect me and everything. Baker was very active. Loved to be around his friends. Loved to be playing outside. He's a very good football player, he's very fast. His only problem with that was he, he was prone to get hurt, which he did. That's how he broke his uh, collarbone, and making a great run at Clay Chalkville and had to have surgery. He had, you know, a lower tab and I would give it to him. I suppose, though, that was when he experienced how it made him feel. I grew up in a wonderful household. I was the oldest of three sisters. I was oftentimes in trouble. When I was six years old, I was diagnosed with ADHD, and it was a very severe case. I was put on a stimulant in order to function. That's a very young age to learn you ingest a prescription chemical and you're gonna feel a different way. I've known Baker since I uh, moved to Vestavia, honestly, in the third grade. Class clowns together. If he got in trouble, I got in trouble with him. Me and him were like brothers. He could hang out with you whether you were into sports or whether you into video games or really anything. College was just a whole new experience. You know, you got people at parties smoking, um, going upstairs, you know, doing cocaine, all kinds of stuff that I had never even seen before. Everybody's just doing it. The first time that I tried painkillers, I had heard about them from friends at school, and I was like, well, I'm gonna give that a shot. I found a leftover bottle. I took them, and I remember feeling like I was flying, and like this, is the feeling that I have been searching for my entire life. I suddenly felt like, <sighs> like everything is okay. All of a sudden, I felt like I fit in. Even though I'm sitting by myself, you know, I'm 15 years old, I'm watching TV, all the lights are out. You could tell Baker was very um, conflicted at points. He wanted to please his parents, but at the same time, he wanted to have a good time in school. Plenty of times we cried about it, just trying to figure out the balance between the two without having to cut off the, the party scene, because we did love to party. I went to college. I had two majors. I went to school in Paris for a year. And I was in this great group of people, and yet here I have this other side of me that is looking through your medicine cabinets every time you turn your back, because I've got to get what I need to feel better. He had a fall from being drunk at a party one time. He was having back pains, and so I knew he had gotten hard on the painkillers to, you know, make himself feel better. But at one point, you know, those lower tabs and those Roxy's and Oxy's, all that stops working. And you ended up taking six of them and wasted, you know, $200. And, you know, you got this little bag of, you know, heroin, and it's $20, and it's a lot stronger. Baker progressed over towards the heroin, um, and it progressed quickly. Within the first week of trying 
the needle. I had overdosed two times accidentally. The ER doctor said to my parents, if you're praying kind of people, you better hit your knees because she 50-50 might not make it. I was so ashamed and scared out of my mind. And so went to rehab, um, and this is multiple, multiple rehabs. But, you know, I'd be able to put together long increments of sobriety and then fall off the wagon. And it was like, how could this have happened again? Like, I'm doing all the prescribed things that I'm supposed to be doing, and yet I'm still needing that relief. Like, what's wrong? What is wrong with me? Our brains were not designed to handle the onslaught of opiates. When you're in withdrawal or you haven't had enough, all these neurons are firing off saying like, give me my stuff, give me my stuff. It'd be like if I took a plastic bag right now and put it over your head. Like eventually you would start fighting me to get that bag off your head because you'd start suffocating, right? That is what addiction is like for people who are in craving mode. You become like an animal. You're so single-mindedly like, what do I have to do to feel better? Baker actually did it a lot. He was very defensive with me. He wasn't talking to me. I had lost a lot of weight. Um, sleeping all day, chills. If he didn't have it, he was just a terrible person. As soon as he got it, he was relaxed. Um, but at the same time, he was never Baker. Uh, even if he had it or not, it wasn't him. It was a uh, Monday night. So I went and saw him, and I questioned him about, you know, his drug use. And he told me then that he had, he had tried heroin, but that he was, he was getting help. And he had been to a counselor there at the university. And he said, look at me, do I look like I'm on drugs? I said, no, you look great. I said, but I'm coming back in a couple of days and I'm gonna bring a drug test with me and we're gonna make sure. And it was that day. So I'm calling Baker, uh, his phone's off and that's unlike him, he's like me, my phone's never off. And I'm calling him from, you know, eight in the morning till two o'clock in the afternoon. All right, when I pulled into the apartment complex, I pulled in behind the ambulance. I kept praying, please don't turn toward his apartment. Of course it did. I knew as soon as I saw him, man, he was blue and his arch, back was arched up and he was stuck like this. And I just knew. We called the cops. You know, my girlfriend's trying to do CPR on him. Blood's coming out of his mouth, man. It's just, it, it, it was terrible. I was just hoping, praying that he could still be with us. But I knew I lost my best friend. And I'd never see him again. I'm gonna miss being a complete family. Whenever my parents suggest doing things, like trying something new, I honestly don't want to because I'd rather not feel like we're missing someone. It's just devastating to not have him here. He was just so much fun and in such a joy. Yes, 95% of the parents out there, what's the worst thing in the world that could, could happen to you? And it would be to lose a child. And so that's what we live with. For now, it's the worst thing that could to be happen, has happened to us. Okay. 
I'm the only one in my family who has this. My sisters, they're dealing with babies and bottles, and I'm just trying to like not stick a needle in my arm every day. Even though it's been years since I have stuck a needle in my arms, it's still like, it's two steps away, you know? It's right behind me. If I had been able to be honest about it and not brush it under the rug, you know, that would have, that could have changed everything. I should have said something to his parents. I should have done something. I should have done more. Um, I know he had tried to stop on his own, um, and I thought he did, but he had lied to me, and and I didn't keep up with him. And I feel like you know, if I had done more to help, you know, he'd still be here. Baker got a 35 on his ACT. Was going to be an engineer, a doctor. He was one of the best people I knew, man. Uh, he'd give you the shirt off of his back, and I've seen him do it. They always assume things about people who have died of a drug overdose that maybe they came from a family who wasn't supportive, or maybe they were just into stuff and they deserved it. But I don't think people realize that this can happen to anyone. Heroin doesn't discriminate, you know, drugs don't discriminate. They'll kill you if you're living in poverty, whether you're rich. And it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. I know you feel like you're invincible, but and it's not worth it. You know, there's so much more to live for than the next high. Yeah, so much more to live for.